You are listening to True Crime Twins, a true crime podcast hosted by Chloe and Melina Cantor. True Crime Twins is distributed by Glassbox Media and is part of the Crawlspace Media family. Welcome back to True Crime Twins, where we use our academic and occupational backgrounds in criminology and medicine to tell you crime stories. I'm Chloe. And I'm Melina. Thank you for joining us for another week of true crime. Today's case is the 2010 murder of Yardley Reynolds Love, a UVA lacrosse player who at 22 years old was found beaten to death in her bed by her roommate. Yardley was later determined to have died by blunt force trauma to the head. The manner of death was homicide. Her door had been broken down. Her laptop was stolen. Yardley had recently ended a relationship with George Hughley V. He was a very wealthy guy from Maryland. They were both lacrosse players, so their social circles often overlapped. They had a lot of the same friends, and they were known to have a very volatile relationship, particularly on the part of George, because he abused alcohol severely. And that was actually a problem before he went to University of Virginia. Back when he was younger, he got charged with possession of alcohol by a minor, and he failed to disclose that when he was applying for colleges, of course. He was having drinking problems for a very, very long time, and According to witness accounts, everything would escalate when he was drinking. That charge was rather serious because he also resisted arrest. The female officer was trying to arrest him and he was fighting back. He was yelling, insulting, demeaning comments to her, and she ended up having to tase him to subdue him. So it was a pretty severe event. This occurred in Charlottesville, Virginia, in an off-campus apartment at the University of Virginia campus. Yardley was born on July 17, 1987, in Baltimore, Maryland, so a cancer. She was the daughter of John and Sharon Love and the sister of Lexi Love. The family lived in Cockeysville, Maryland. She attended Notre Dame Preparatory School and was a member of the varsity lacrosse and field hockey teams. By happenstance, I had met someone who actually knew Yardley and George Hughley firsthand from being involved in UVA lacrosse, and I had questions for her about both people. And she said that in her experience, Yardley was a very good leader. She was a supremely talented lacrosse player and was recognized as a role model by younger members of the lacrosse team. She didn't have as kind things to say about George, who she felt was very status-oriented, was careless, self-centered, cold, maybe a little sloppy. But by all accounts, Yardley was a highly athletic, talented, intelligent, beautiful young woman filled with promise. She was majoring in political science and minored in Spanish at the University of Virginia, and she was a member of a sorority, Kappa Alpha Theta. George uh, Virgo, September 17th, 1987, being his birthday, was born in Washington, D.C. He also grew up in Maryland, but in a town called Chevy Chase, which is an affluent area, as was the area Yardley grew up in. And he attended a private all-boys school called the Landon School in Bethesda, which is another high socioeconomic area. It seems that George and Yardley had similar upbringings, same state, surrounded by surrounded by people who are of a higher socioeconomic status and people with more money, people have more influence and that can be influential in how certain people are raised when there is unchecked privilege and we see the consequences of this in the true crime world commonly. And I think this is a perfect example of that, which will become clearer the further we dive into this story. George played lacrosse and football at Landon, and he was the quarterback. 
Yardley and George had been together for about two years, and they split not long before Yardley was murdered. In the early morning hours of May 3rd, 2010, the police were called to Love's room by her roommate, who found her lying face down on the floor. It's strange because the roommate initially reported alcohol poisoning, but when the police got there, it was obvious that she had severe physical injuries. There was a lot of blood. She was lying basically in a pool of blood, and it was clear that there was foul play and that a serious crime had occurred and somebody, whoever's responsible, is out there. The next day, May 4th, George was arrested. Shockingly, he did not plan this out very well. It seemed as though the night of May 2nd, or a few hours before she was found, Yardley was definitely dead for a while when she was found, and apparently her death was slow. His story was that he didn't actually hit her, that he was mad at her. He had been sending her some threatening emails and texts. He said that he drunkenly kicked down her door, grabbed her, and shook her repeatedly, and that her head hit the wall. He said that when he left the room, that Yardley was alive and just had a bloody nose, even though she didn't have a bloody nose, according to the police, when they found her. Oddly enough, after all of this was said and done, the police interrogation clip of George basically being told by the interrogator that Yardley was dead, he seemed to me to be genuinely shocked. I don't know if his brain tricked itself in denial and he just like couldn't really absorb or process what he had done because all he was willing to admit to was that he may have accidentally hurt her when he was drunk and angry. He seemed to really, unless he's like a fantastic actor, He was inconsolably crying. He didn't believe the interrogator. He kept saying, she's not fucking dead. And he seemed like absolutely devastated. So I don't really know what to make of that. But basically his lawyers, his mother, they all say that it was an accident. It was a drunken accident. He didn't mean to kill her. That wasn't his intent. So I guess, I don't know, under that logic, it's manslaughter. George ended up being convicted of second-degree murder, and he was sentenced to 25 years in prison. And now, a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks for listening to our sponsors. Now back to the show. Specifically, Hughley admitted that he, quote, may have shook her a little bit and, quote, may have grabbed her neck. He demonstrated that he kicked her door down He was so upset during that revelation that Yardley was dead and, you know, he's crying in the video. And according to a court reporter that was there, when that was shown in court, Yardley's sister was also pretty visibly tearful and distraught upon listening to that. And one might think that she even believed in the sincerity of his reaction based on, you know, her emotional reaction. But it's hard to interpret that, of course. He said, kill me. And because of his reaction, I think that convinced the jury that the murder might not have been a first degree murder case, which would involve premeditation. It would be a second degree murder case, which is in the heat of the moment and not premeditated. What do you think about that? I wish that there was something between first degree and second degree, like first and a half degree, (laughs) because I think that it was out of an angry outburst, like a drunken rage. I don't think he necessarily planned to kill her that specific time, but he was threatening to kill her. And he had shown previously that he was capable of hurting her. So these are credible threats and clearly shows that he was thinking about it. But I think in that exact moment, did he intend on it? No. But did he intend on inflicting serious bodily harm? Yes. She was severely bruised all over her body. She had a black eye and a swollen eye socket, torn lip, injuries in her mouth, and her tongue was black and blue. There was indications that there was some pressure applied to her carotid artery. So either she was strangled or choked or otherwise pushed down on that area of her neck. That very well could have been the cause of death, according to the coroner, besides 
all of the beatings and the blood loss, which probably would have been enough already, the pressure on the carotid artery makes it so the brain is starved of oxygen. It's not clear, but they think that she may have died a slow, painful death alone for hours before she was found. It's clear that George had a untreated alcohol addiction problem based on past arrest and his behavior in the immediate proximity to Yardley Love's murder. There was an incident not long before the murder where Yardley was strangled by George in front of witnesses near a neighboring school after a game. The lacrosse players from both teams were intermingling and George, apparently in a drunken rage, started strangling Yardley and a member of the opposing team rescued her from the situation and drove her back to her residence. And as he testified in court, they'd spent the night together. And later on, George had sent Yardley threatening emails saying, I should have killed you when I found out about that, which perhaps is why he stole her computer after the incident, which shows some presence of mind there because he didn't steal it for its monetary value. He probably stole it for its evidentiary value because he had made death threats in writing on that very machine. So he wanted to get rid of it. I don't know if he had tried to delete evidence off his own computer. There was evidence on his clothes of blood. He was charged for the theft of the computer, but obviously the most punitive charge was second-degree murder. George had a pretty eventful day. It kind of reminds me of the day Michael Skakel had, who has since been released after his conviction was overturned in the 1975 murder of Martha Moxley, which is a case that we covered in an early episode of True Crime Twins. So if you feel like you want to listen to something else, please feel free to listen to it. It's a very interesting case. But similarly to Michael Skakel, on the day of the crime, the offender in this case George Hughley had been drinking pretty much all day. He had been around friends. I think he had been on a golf course. He was just layering on layering on layering on his drunkenness. And he had been in contact with several women trying to meet up for a date or some sort of sexual rendezvous. And he was being turned down. Perhaps he was trying to find a distraction for his anger in a sexual encounter. And he was not successful in getting one. Or maybe that's why he later went to Yardley Love's residence, because maybe he was hoping for something and maybe she wouldn't let him in. And that was what triggered him to kill her. Or because of the continued rejections, he had no distraction from his feelings of rage toward Yardley that had been stewing and eventually erupted when perhaps he had even more alcohol later that evening. And in a state of severe drunkenness where perhaps he wasn't fully aware of his actions, he, but according to a jury without premeditation, visited Yardley Love's residence where she was sleeping alone while her roommate and her roommate's friend who later found her, they were out drinking or out to dinner, but Yardley was too tired. She didn't join them. She went to sleep. George broke into her room by kicking her door down and murdered her with his hands. George Hughley is expected to be released from prison when he's in his 40s. He will be able to basically start over. He comes from wealth and opportunity. I'm sure that he will be able to resume his life with relative normalcy. He could still start a family. He could basically do whatever he wants with the financial reach I don't really know how just that is because Yardley was just stolen from this life. Her poor sister, her poor mother, they managed to bring something good out of it. They created the One Love Foundation, which educates young people about domestic violence and what to look for. It's a brilliant way to honor her memory. I just wonder what Yardley would have done if this hadn't happened, what she would have done with her life. She could have done anything she wanted. Look what her mom did for her. That's where she came from. Sharon Love recently sued George Hughley for wrongful death, asking for over $29 million in damages. After litigation, 
the judge awarded Sharon Love $15 million in damages. When someone's murdered, the perpetrator is typically somebody that they knew. And when there is a victim-offender relationship, it's pretty easy to tie together what happened because you have obvious suspects right away based on what you know about who that person spent the most time with. In cases of intimate partner violence murder, it seems that the toxic connection between the offender and the victim blurs the lines of what should be love and what becomes evil because it is a unfortunately too common motive behind killing is that intimate partner rage. It happens in the middle of a fight. It happens in retaliation for something. The person who's most likely to kill a young woman is someone who lives in her home. Like That's just a criminological fact and it's disturbing, but it's true. And that's a reality that we all live in and ignoring it doesn't make it go away. So it was pretty obvious who killed Yardley Love. And I think he tried to blame the incident on alcohol. I believe he even called, or his defense on behalf of him, called it a drunken accident. And I do believe he was heavily intoxicated that day. In fact, evidence certainly suggests that he was. I think it contributed to his uncontrolled and violent behavior that night. But I don't think it is the explanation behind his behavior. I think it was a contributor and an aggravating factor to his behavior that night, but it isn't a justification. And if he were a normal person, sober, you wouldn't commit a murder when you're drunk. That's my opinion based on what I've seen of other killers, other violent people who blame their behavior on being drunk. Being drunk doesn't give you a new personality. And this is something that we've discussed at length in past episodes. Before, when you were describing his behavior and how he gets when he drinks, I was just thinking to myself, like, what is he so mad about? Clearly, he has this serious anger issue that was unresolved, not addressed. And I agree that it just brought out the anger more. It didn't make him a different person. I want to put it out there that if anybody's listening to this and they can identify with anything that we spoke about regarding this relationship and this murder... If you are in danger, you can call 1-800-799-7233 or text START to 88788. More than one in three women and one in three men will be in an abusive relationship in their lifetime, according to the CDC. This trend is even more common in trans and non-binary people who experience this form of victimization 50% of the time. Please check out One Love, which was formed by Yardley Love's family, at joinonelove.org. Thank you for listening to True Crime Twins. If you find our content interesting, please give us a five-star review and a nice rating on your preferred platform. Please follow us on social media where you can keep up with us. On TikTok, we're at True Crime Twins. On Instagram, we're at True Crime Twins Podcast. And on Twitter, we're at True Crime Twins. Please email us with questions, comments, or case suggestions at truecrimetwinspodcast at gmail.com.